All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's Matt Bowles here from Maverick Investor Group. I want to welcome everybody to a very special webinar this evening. We are going to get started right on time here at the top of the hour. Uh, I see a bunch of people still jumping on. We want to respect everybody's time and definitely don't want to miss a minute of the content uh, that we have for you tonight. This is Real Estate Asset Protection 101 featuring Megan Hughes, who I'm going to introduce in just a minute. I want to start off very uh, quickly just with some basic housekeeping items uh, as well as an introduction. So you have your control panel on the right hand side of your screen uh, and in that control panel you have a chat box that is going to allow you to communicate with us and uh, also to ask your questions. So if you want to check it out right now, let me just start by asking everybody a question and you can respond to me in the chat box. How many people uh, on the webinar right now, is this your first Maverick event ever? You've never been to a Maverick Investor Group webinar before tonight. Go ahead and, and write in the chat box that it is your first Maverick event and if it's uh, if you've been to Maverick events before, uh, I noticed, of course, a, a number of our clients here who have bought real estate through us and so forth, um, you can indicate that um, it is not your first Maverick event. Uh, so either way, go ahead and type that into the chat box, and then we'll be able to see that, um, and, and uh, it's sort of the way that we can communicate with each other. I can ask questions, you can respond, and so forth. Um, and as you're doing that, uh, I will also give you sort of a brief overview tonight. We are going to go about 45 minutes of content is what we sort of expect, 45 to 60 minutes. Um, uh, and then we're going to have an open question and answer session uh, with Megan Hughes uh, at the end where you're going to be able to ask your personal questions to her uh, and get her answers live on the event tonight. Uh, I think a lot of the questions are going to be covered during the content of the webinar. It's going to be a very substantive webinar, um, but uh, you know I've asked her to present it in a way that for people who are new to this topic, that it will be digestible. So it's not going to assume a lot of knowledge. At the same time, for people that do have some background, um, it will also be pretty substantive, uh, and you'll certainly be able to go deeper and ask your questions at the end. But I would definitely encourage you to take notes. Uh, with what we have here for you tonight. So awesome. So a ton of people are responding and a lot of people it's their first time uh, on a Maverick event which is awesome. Um, and, and let me just uh, begin with about a two minute kind of overview of Maverick for people that are new. Um, you may have heard of Maverick Investor Group. Obviously you have if you're on this webinar. Um, we are a community of real estate investors uh, and also we have a network of real estate agents that are able to invite their real estate investor clients um, onto our events. Uh, we've been featured in, in a bunch of the major uh, real estate press um, and basically uh, what we do, uh, our value proposition, is that we help you to buy performing rental properties in the best real estate markets regardless of where you live. Okay, uh, And in addition to that, in addition to helping you build your real estate portfolio of cash flowing rental properties, we also bring you uh, we also want to bring you educational content like we're bringing tonight. We want to bring uh, industry experts um, and top specialists in different parts uh, of the real estate uh, and tangentially related industries that can help you with your real estate investing. So we want to try to provide as much value to you as we can. Um, you're our community uh, and many of the people here uh, are certainly building their real estate portfolios through Maverick. So when we can bring you a webinar like this, and show you how to protect the real estate investments that you're making. Um, that adds value to you and we want to do as much of that as we can. So this webinar tonight is a, a completely educational webinar. Uh, there's nothing that's going to be sold on this webinar. Um, we are just, uh, you know, Megan is here tonight uh, as a, favorite, a personal favorite to me. Uh, we've had a, a long, um, have known each other for a very long time. Uh, she has been an advisor uh, to uh, Maverick and the partners uh, uh, and owners of Maverick Investor Group. She's been an advisor to many of the Maverick clients um, in setting up their business entities and their asset protection strategies for the real estate uh, portfolio building plans uh, and everything else. So uh, I've known Megan for probably 
Oh, I don't know. At least five years, uh, I would say. Um, uh, she is, uh, if you're not familiar with Megan, she is a best-selling author. She has been working in the legal field for 25 years across three countries, uh, and she is one of the most foremost uh, and renowned uh, experts on asset protection, and specifically asset protection as it remains as it uh, pertains to real estate, but also business building and 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 things like that. And has worked with a lot of our entrepreneur clients on those uh, spaces as well. But tonight we're specifically talking about real estate asset protection. Uh, you are in for a real treat. This is one of the top experts in the country on this issue. Um, and so we're going to go through about 45 minutes of content, as I said, and then we're going to have an open q and I, I, you know, I always feel that when you're in the presence of, of an expert of this caliber, that uh, one of the most valuable parts of it is for you being able to interact directly with them and ask your questions directly to them in an open Q&A forum. And so Megan has agreed to uh, hang out tonight. Uh, and uh, provide that forum for you. So uh, take out your pens, uh, get ready to take some notes, and um, then we'll have the Q&A at the end. And with that, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Megan Hughes. Thank you for being here. Hi, Matt. I, I don't even know how to respond to all those accolades. It's a good thing you guys can't see my face. I'm probably blushing right now. But I do appreciate it, and I am really happy to be here. Um, and, and just to be able to talk to all of you, I'm, I'm beginning to see an awful lot of interest from people in the asset protection field again, and, and a lot of new people that I haven't heard from before. You know, I, like a lot of people, my business kind of really has gone up and down and certainly went down when, when the, the real estate market crashed and burned, and so it's kind of nice to see people coming back in. I mean, it tells me a couple of things. First of all, it tells me that the market is beginning to heat up, and that brings people in. The second thing it tells me is that now is the time to get information and get good information into people's hands before they either you know spend a ton of money on setting up something that doesn't work for them or they wind up in trouble because they haven't spent any money to, to do any sort of asset protection at all. Um, so today, all I, what I really want to do today is keep things basic. I want to talk about just five elements of asset protection. These are the five things that I really, really think that you have to know. Um, the five things are the best entity structure um, that, that I see, and this will work for beginner and for middle and advanced real estate portfolios. I want to talk about the LL tax secret that everybody needs to know. Um, this is the one that the tax pros know, and you need to as well if, if this is what you're doing. I want to talk about how to get good, airtight, solid asset protection without overpaying. I want to talk about the number one mistake that real estate makers and most people make once they do get their asset protection set up. And then I want to talk a little bit about the myth of sort of the Delaware, Wyoming, Nevada triangle of companies. So that's, that's where I'm going. Those are the only things I really want to touch on and then we can get into some other stuff with questions as we go, but for, for now these are the five main areas that I'm focusing on today. So I want to start uh, with the best entity structure and you know as soon as you say like oh of the best then I also need you to understand that there really isn't a one-size-fits-all approach that's going to work for everybody and so what, what I'm going to say today might work for you but it might not work for the person next to you. And you've got five choices coming in on this. You've got five choices and they boil down to this. The first one is the simplest. You hold it in your own name, you get a lot of insurance, and you hope for the best. And this does work. I know there are a lot of people that still do this. They've got all of their real estate in their name. They've got heavy-duty liability insurance policies in place, and they don't worry about having a structure. And when it works, it works. But when it goes wrong, it can be really, really dangerous, especially when you have a lot of assets. The more you've got, the bigger a target that you're painting because in the event of a lawsuit everything that's in your name is potentially something that could be targeted for sale, for seizure, for foreclosure. So you know that's that's kind of the first one that, that is not my favorite. Um, the second one is holding things in a trust and this is another really popular choice but trusts still don't give you an awful lot of legal protection. A standard revocable trust, the kind where you can change at any time, you're moving assets in and out, doing whatever, they're not protected structures. And so in the event of a lawsuit, a court's going to go right through it, right through to the person who is, you know, the trustee and the beneficiary. And usually that's you, you know, and you're making this trust on your own behalf. 
Now, you can get some protection with a trust, but they do get a lot more complicated. Um, maybe you've heard the term irrevocable trust. That's one of them. But that in and of itself can give you extra headaches itself. You're, you're most likely going to have another tax return to look at an irrevocable trust, and it's going to cost you more money to set up, and it can also tie your hands when you want to make changes and you're wanting to move properties in and out of the trust. So again, it, it's not one that, that I would just throw like for, for the, off, you know, as an off-the-cuff thing to say, hey, let's do this, we'll find it on the internet. It would not be my choice. Um, the third one is holding things in a corporation. And this can work, but honestly, unless you are buying with the specific intent of reselling quickly, so the, the flipping um, aspect, then this is a really problematic choice. First of all, you're going to lose out on a lot of the tax benefits when you're buying a property to hold and rent it out. On the other hand, um, if you don't live in the United States and you're in fact investing from outside the U.S. coming in, this actually this approach can work. So again, this is one of those one size fits all doesn't work. Um, so for those of you that are outside the country, you can do this. It, you will sacrifice some tax savings. But on the other hand, you can simplify your own U.S. tax reporting and estate tax obligations. The fourth one I want to talk about is, is limited partnerships. And this used to be the hands-down way to go for all American investors. And it's still a really, really good solid choice, but it's got some downsides. And, and the biggest one that I see is the extra cost that you're going to spend in actually protecting yourself through it. Um, a limited partnership is made up of two partners at least. Okay, You've got to have a limited partner who is actually, they're passive, they hold ownership, but they don't do anything. They don't participate in the, um, the daily business operations. And that's good because in the case of a lawsuit, you're going to be safe. The partnership may go down if the whole thing gets sued and it, it falls apart. What you, may, what you stand to lose is what you've invested. You know, somebody's not going to come through that and come at your other assets. But the other role in a limited partnership is that of the general partner. And this is the one that's the problem. And that's because it's actually an asset protection hole. Uh, Matt, can you flip the slide? Yep. Thanks. Um, the general partner is the one who controls everything. So it's a super powerful position. They're the only ones that can do everything. They have unlimited power within the, the partnership. But they also have unlimited liability. When you're acting as a general partner of a limited partnership, you are always on the hook for any sort of problems that happen, for any debts that you incur, while the, for the time that you're acting as a partner. And this liability can follow you. So, for example, you know, you, say you were a general partner, you're in a limited partnership, and you were in it between like 2008, 2010, like right when the market went kablooey. You left the partnership in 2010. However, anything that happened from 20, you know, 2008 to 2010 still affects you, even now in 2015. There's a look back, and, and you could still be on the hook for anything bad that went on during that two-year period. So it's you know it, it's a problem now. People get around that liability by incorporating a second company, and they use that second company to act as the general partner. And remember that anytime you've got an incorporated structure, you've got a liability insulator. Now the incorporated structure, in the same circumstance, they may get sued but they can't bust through that incorporated structure to get to you personally even if you are still the 100 percent owner of both the partnership and that corporation you're protected through the corporate veil from on, on the general partner side and you're protected again because you're only a limited partner so the upside is that you've got great liability protection but the downside is all the extra costs now you're running two structures and that means that you've got two extra everythings and extra tax returns. Now, I, I want to just tangent out, and this is the only time I'm going to tangent, I promise. But I do want to tangent out on a couple of, of partnerships that I'm seeing a lot of people talk about right now. And those are LLPs and LLLPs. The LLP is a partnership where you do not have limited partners. You only have general partners. And it's one that we see in a lot of professional organizations, a group of lawyers want to get together, a group of doctors want to get together. And they usually use that because they have the ability to shield from each other's liability. So if you've got a bunch of lawyers working together, you've got somebody is sued for malpractice, it doesn't necessarily take the entire partnership down. 
the other partners are able to kind of wall themselves off and leave that partner to deal with the liability on their own. So it's, it's great in that situation, but I don't see how it works really well in a real estate situation because in your situation, the problem comes from outside. You, your danger is somebody suing the partnership because maybe they've been injured on the property. Something bad has happened. And in that case, I don't see that a limited liability partnership will protect you. Um, so it's, it's not one that I would recommend. The other kind of derivative is the triple LP. And that one's kind of a hybrid between a regular partnership and a limited partnership. You've got the same, you've got limited partners who are completely insulated. They can only lose whatever they invest in. And in this one, the general partners are also given some liability for the debts and the actions when they're acting as a general partner. Um, now, the, the level of that protection does vary from state to state. And it's a new type of structure. You know, Nevada Limited Liability Partnership Law says, basically, unless it says otherwise in your documentation, you will be given legal protection from the debt or the liability of the partnership unless whoever is trying the case determines that it would be against public interest for you to escape. So on the face of it, it, it would seem that you could run with this LLLP and not have to go the old-fashioned route of having a corporate general partner, and you'd be okay and you'd save some money. However, my caveat on that is that this is really new law. This is largely untested, and it's going to be tested against something like 200 years of tried and true case law when it finally does, because that's how long existing partnership law has been around. So I think that this is also not even available in every state, Right now, I believe that 21 states have enacted LLLP legislation, which means that you've got a lot that haven't. And if you are creating a limited liability, limited partnership, and you do not want to go, you want to act personally as a general partner, then I absolutely would say do not do this unless you are working exclusively in a state that supports this legislation and says right out in its own law that, that you'll be given that protection. Um, I know that most attorneys that I talk to, you know, from day to day, they're still recommending that you use that second company, um, and and that, you know, just to keep you safe. And that doesn't even begin to touch on some of the tax issues that can come up using the LLLP. Um, for example, those of you who understand and who use and rely upon the real estate professional deduction to help you to take those unlimited losses. Uh, this is a structure that you in particular want to stay far away from because there's a very good chance that using this would cause the IRS to blow your, your election and that would really wind up costing you money. And so with that said, that takes me then to the last of my structure choices, the limited liability company. And personally, I think that this one is the winner in most cases for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and what it is, a limited liability company is, is a hybrid of a partnership and a corporation. What you can do is you can have active operators and you can have passive owners, just like a partnership, but you don't have that personal liability associated with the management position. So as long as you're acting in good faith in the best interests of the LLC and you're not personally indebting yourself deliberately on behalf of the LLC, you're usually going to be safe from any liability that comes up against it. And that, that's kind of the one key difference that has made the LLC so popular. It's because you don't need that second company to protect yourself, so your costs are going to be lower. Now, there is another kind of a, a, another derivation on that LLC, and that's called a series LLC. This is a really cool structure for some advanced planning, especially if you've got a bigger portfolio. But it is outside of what we're talking about today. Um, if you're interested, tell Matt. Demand from Matt, and we could do our own webinar on it. And there's also information on my website, the smartbusinessincorporation.com, uh, that, that will tell you and help you learn more about the series LLC. And I'm happy to come back and do another webinar just looking at that one in the future if, if people are interested. But turning back just to our regular LLC, okay, there are two ways to set up an LLC. And you can set it up to be a single layer structure. And that's one where everybody has the right to participate in all of the decisions. Everybody signs checks. Everybody can sign contracts and everybody can do everything that's needed in the business. We call that one a member-managed LLC. 
and it works really really well in situations where you're the only owner or maybe it's you and your spouse or you and one partner or maybe you and two partners but imagine it falls apart pretty quickly when you start to have large groups of people working together because you've got far too many people now in theory who can be involved in the management of the business and I think that that can lead to kind of administrative chaos um, just there's no question the second way to set up an LLC is actually the way that I prefer to do it and I will do it 99 percent of the time and that's called a manager managed LLC and this LLC has a traditional two-layer structure so you've got your owners who are more passive and you've got your managers and those are the people who actively work the business who they're the ones who are signing checks they're the ones that are doing the contracts now managers will be members they're also going to be owners in most cases but the owners don't automatically have to be the managers and I like this structure because it gives you as the owners a lot more flexibility for example um, let's say that you're running a successful business you know your real estate thing is growing and your brother-in-law Bob wants in on the deal now Bob is nice Bob can barbecue like a madman but Bob is not a numbers guy so in Bob's case it may be a lot better to take his money and make him a member of an LLC which lets you stay in control as the manager now Bob is still gonna make some money but you don't have a headache you don't have Bob interfering in the business because he's passive and you can apply that same logic to a family-based business you know maybe you want to start giving some ownership to your kids but you don't want them in any way shape or form having any control over the business you know and you could always make somebody a manager at a later date so I, I love this one and I think that this is one of those hacks that I think that every LLC owner should know the difference between a member and a manager managed LLC it doesn't cost you any more to set it up like this but the flexibility that you gain and the options that you gain with the manager managed structure always wins out for me so the other reason <clears throat> Um, the other reason that LLCs win the what's best debate for me is actually their tax flexibility which is bringing me to my second point which you see on the screen the top secret that tax pros know what you should the one thing that LLCs do better than anything else is tax and I say that because LLCs can do something really unique they can make their own tax election so you can take any type of an LLC it can be manager managed member managed it can be formed in Georgia formed in Delaware and you can tell the IRS and the state tax people how you want to tax it you may want to tax it as a sole proprietorship or as a, a corporation or even an S corporation no other structure can do this a partnership always has to be taxed as a partnership you know corporation is either a C corporation or an S corporation but an LLC can be anything and it can change over time as it needs to and why this is important at least to me it depends on you and what you are doing with your LLC for example I know that some of you are looking to buy property and you intend to flip that property which is awesome but if you use an LLC that is taxed either as a sole proprietorship so it reports on your personal tax return or you're in it with with other people and it's being taxed as a partnership you are gonna make, pay more in taxes than you need to and the reason for this is because flipping income is not considered passive income by the IRS they look at it the same way that they would look at W-2 income and that means you've got self-employment tax that's going to be added onto your tax bill now given that right now even just at the federal level you're looking at adding a 15 percent tax hit you know so anything that, that you can do that will reduce or eliminate that tax is, is something that you want to do so if you flip or if you're buying raw land and developing it or if you're buying a property and you're looking at it you know maybe buying a house and converting it into a duplex or triplex anything like that really consider when you're looking at your LLC look at considering making that proper election to get it taxed as an S corporation or C corporation because in your case you can eliminate that self-employment tax hit now if you're buying properties to hold for the long term the reverse is true now you want that default taxation you want that sole prop tax for for one owner companies you want that partnership for two plus owner companies and that's because this is long-term income it's considered passive and it's perfect for these tax classifications 
In fact, if you go the other way, you wind up shooting yourself in the foot because you're going to wind up paying more tax when you sell the property. Um, you lose, especially if you go into a corporation, a traditional C corporation, you lose capital gains. And so you take you know, this, this nice 15% possible rate and bump it up to at least 25% or more. So bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. Now, when you've got an LLC, you get to make this choice. And sometimes you don't even know which one you want to be yet. The, the cool thing, again, about this is that you can make this tax choice in a retroactive way. So for an S corporation, for example, God, the IRS brought out new legislation, I think, in 2013 that lets us go back up to three years to make a retroactive election. Now, the chances are it's not going to take you that long to figure out that you wanted to be that, but it's really nice to know that you've got that flexibility to do it. And again, it only, only, only happens with this one company, and that's the big takeaway. You know, buy and holds, you want passive tax. Flips and developments, you want an active tax. And if you're doing both, and I know a lot of you are, then look at creating separate companies because this is one of those where there's no good way to mix the income in a single company. No matter what you do, something is going to be taxed more than it needs to. And that brings me then to my third point, which is how I don't want you to overpay for your good asset protection. Every so often somebody will come to me and they'll come and they'll bring like this monster of a structure, something that involves multiple companies, might have a couple of trusts or maybe an offshore entity tucked in there and so on. And usually this person is fairly new to investing and they're really new to business structures. And almost inevitably they have paid a ton of money for all of this stuff. I have heard from people who have dropped, you know, between ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars or more on these these incredibly overcomplicated plans. And I find this really frustrating from a professional standpoint. In most cases, I think that there's so much, too much going on, and it doesn't make economic sense for you. Money that you could be using to better your investments, I think you're wasting on extra tax returns, endless annual report requirements, company renewals, advisor meetings to learn how to use this thing that, that is so overcomplicated doesn't make sense. And sometimes, you know, you've been given the wrong advice coming in. I had somebody come to me who had four or five different corporations. Each one of those corporations had property put inside it. And no matter what we did, there was no way for us to unwind it without him spending a bunch of money just on getting the properties out of those corporations and back into an entity that was better suited for that tax. Even though he was the only owner, even though he was, just because it had been in that corporation first, pulling property out of a corporation has a tax consequence. So I really believe strongly when it comes to this, I really do believe strongly in the keep it simple school of thought. And especially when you don't have a lot of properties. You know, a single properly formed LLC where you thought it out ahead of time and you formed it in the right state, it can give you excellent protection and it can give you the room that you need to grow. You don't need all these extra layers of companies and partnerships. You don't need land trusts to hide ownership if you set your deals up properly with your LLC in the first place. Offshore trusts, you don't need them. They're difficult to set up, they're expensive, and they're a complete bullseye for the IRS. Anything offshore, they're coming looking for it. And even if you've done nothing wrong and everything is absolutely above board, I don't see the point in, in putting yourself out there for extra scrutiny if you don't have to. Now, there is times when you are going to need more than one LLC as simple as you want to keep it and again that will depend on the number of properties you've got and where you live. So as I said before I really like series LLCs in states that have series LLC law. Now in the states where you don't have the law I, I'm not as keen as I have been in the past. Using a Nevada series LLC that you've also registered to do business in Ohio for example means that you are relying, in, in the event that you wind up in court, you are relying on an Ohio court to give Nevada law precedence over their own law if anything goes wrong. And if those Ohio courts disagree, you could find that the, the whole structure falls apart. I'm not saying that it will happen, I'm saying that it could. And it's an area where the law isn't settled and there was a case that came out at the end of, I think, 2013 that kind of threw everything right back up in the air again. So. It's one of those where I love series LLCs, but only in the right time and the right place. Um, 
again, another place where you might want multiple LLCs is, is your activities. You, you know, your activities. So remember, you want to keep your flips and your developments separate from from your buy and your holds. Um, and and usually, for me, when people come to me and say, okay, well, you know, how much do I put in? I, I've got you know a dozen pieces of property. How much do I put into any one LLC? What I'm usually going to tell you is put whatever you're comfortable in. You know, you might have a number. Maybe you don't want any more than five properties in in any particular LLC. Maybe it's a dollar amount where you say, okay, I don't want to have more than a half a million in equity in a single LLC before I start to break it up. You know, any way you do it with an LLC, you can always grow it, you can always change it, you can always develop things down the road. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect from the from from the get go. And again, this is a structure that lets you grow and change over time. Um, moving to my next one, I wanted to talk about the, the number one mistake that I'm seeing most people make. And this one, there's there's two mistakes, but I really want to talk about one right now, which is maintaining the structure once you built it. I have, honest to God, I have lost track of the number of times somebody's come to me who's had a problem because they forgot or they didn't want to renew their LLC, their partnership, their corporation, and now they've got an issue. And the conversation, it goes like this. The client will call and says, hey, I need a certificate of good standing so I can close on my property sale on Friday. So I'm going to go, I look up their LLC, and I find out, oh, hey, it was dissolved three years ago because you didn't file an annual report. And I've got to go back to that person and say, well, I can't get you a certificate of good standing because you're not in good standing. And to get you in good standing it is going to cost you know X amount of dollars, and it's going to take five to ten days or five to ten weeks, depending on what's happening and what we have to do. Um, I just had somebody come to me with this one. This is why it's really fresh in my mind. He paid somebody to set a company up for him in Tennessee in 2011. He has never filed an annual report. He's never filed a franchise tax report in Tennessee. And Tennessee is one of those funky, funky states where they don't have an income tax on rental income, but if you hold your properties in an LLC in Tennessee, you have to register with the Franchise Tax Board, and you have to pay a minimum of $100 a year in a franchise tax. And to make it worse, the state ties those two things together. So on my guy, because he'd never filed an annual report, his company was canceled by the state because he wasn't complying with the law. Now before I can even begin to get him restored, I have to get something called a tax clearance certificate. That comes from the tax department. And to do that, I have to register him, file all of his back tax returns, pay all of those penalties, pay all of those fees that he should have paid. And only at that point in time will they then issue me the certificate that I need to give to the Secretary of State and then start the whole process again on that side. You know, it's probably, instead of paying $300 a year to keep this thing up to date, it's probably going to cost him well over two grand for me to resurrect this company so he could sell this property. And a simple transaction has become really, really complicated. And, you know, again, at least if my guy had filed his annual report, even if he hadn't paid his franchise tax, if he'd at least filed his report, his company would still be in existence. But, you know, that's what it is. That's where it's at for him. And so, you know, it's another one of the reasons why I say keep it simple. My guy just had one LLC, and he could not keep it together. Now, imagine what would happen if you've got some gigantic multi-headed structure with dozens of this and that and the other, and you're trying to maintain that. I mean, holy jeez. I had a client who had this massive, beautiful structure. He paid somebody about $25,000 to create. And it worked out to, gosh, it cost him, I worked it out, it cost about $5,000 a year just to keep all of those annual reports and registered agents and little tax bits and pieces done. And I showed him a way, once once we, we got to know each other a little better, I showed him a way that I could simplify that and reduce all of that down to, you know, $1,000 from the $5,000 a year he was spending. And that, again, you know, the more structures you've got, the more annual reports you have to file, and the more registered agent fees you have to pay, the more things you have to, to, to track, and the more chances you have of blowing it, which is going to cost you time and cost you money. So keep it simple. Um, and, and just in case you're interested, I said there were two. The other big mistake that I see is where people go through the entire process. They set up their LLC. They're gung-ho. But then they never finish it, and they don't actually transfer in their real estate. That's another one that kills me. If, if you don't 
your LLC can't protect you if you do not use it. So that one, that's my number four point. And the last one I want to talk about is point number five, and I like to sum that up in, in location, location, location. It's like the real estate agent's best friend. Now, something that I used to see all the time in this business was the idea that you would set your company up in Delaware or Nevada or Wyoming, and you would avoid state income tax. So if you lived in a state that had a tax, you could avoid it by doing this. Now, sometimes people would maybe they'd talk you into buying a virtual office package. You'd have a Nevada mailing address. You'd have a Nevada phone number. Um, and, and, you know, they would peddle this as a way to make it a, a legitimate argument that you had a Nevada company that wasn't subject to tax outside of that, you know, and, and just wasn't subject to state tax outside of Nevada. And as we don't have a state income tax, there you go. You know, you've got an immediate saving. The problem is that all of that is not true. Um, the truth is you will be taxed in the state where you are earning income regardless of the entity structure you choose and the location. And I really can't emphasize this enough. All of those strategies that used virtual offices were debunked a very long time ago. Um, the, the federal tax law changed several years ago and it specifically targeted this practice. So anybody that is making that claim to you right now is either misinformed or they are looking somehow to profit from it from you. And the rule of thumb always bear in mind that if you've got a rental property in Georgia, you need to be paying Georgia income tax on that rental income. And that stays the same regardless of where you live. You know, you may not live in Georgia, but it doesn't matter. You made money there, so that's where your tax obligation is. And this is completely independent of whether you set up a Nevada company and you haven't even registered it into Georgia. It doesn't matter. So when somebody comes to me and they ask, okay, where should I set up my LLC? The first thing I look at is where the property or the business is located. And I'm almost always going to tell you, put that register, register the LLC in the state where the activity is taking place. So if you've got an existing LLC that you're using already, and maybe it was started in another state, that's okay. We can still use that. What I'll do in that case is I'll suggest that you take that LLC and you put it into the state where you're working. We call that a cross-registration. And you need to do that because you need to have legal protection in that other state. You don't get it without registering. And this is another one of those gaps in investor knowledge that, that I'm always anxious to, to close you know, and, and tell people about. Um, maybe about three, four years ago, back when in 2011, I had a lot of clients who were coming in um, from overseas, and they were all buying property in Ohio. Now, all of them planned to buy multiple properties. They all had these great ideas. They were going to have giant portfolios, and they asked me to set their, their LLCs up in Delaware. And at the time and in the context of what they planned to do, that made sense. We wanted to use series LLC law, um, and the events of 2013 had not yet happened. But most of the same clients never ever wanted to take the step to spend the extra money and register those LLCs into Ohio. So we had Delaware LLCs kind of flying under the radar running these properties in Ohio and everything made sense and it was okay but flash forward and now I've got a bunch of those tenants that were looking or the bunch of those investors that were looking to evict tenants. Um, and guess what? In Ohio, you can't file an eviction proceeding unless you have either a registered Ohio company or your outside company has been registered to do business into the state. So every one of those clients has been delayed in getting those bad tenants out because they first had to go and get their Delaware LLCs registered into the state. They've had to spend a lot of extra money getting documentation from Delaware on a rush basis. They've had to rush again registering those documents into Ohio and keep paying premium fees to go to the end of the line. And, you know, in most of these cases, these investors, all those big ideas that they had, they never really came to fruition. They never materialized. And so, again, it kind of comes back to my, my keep it simple theory. You know, if they had set up just simple LLCs in Ohio originally, they could have spent a whole lot less on their overall fees, on their yearly maintenance, and certainly been able to boot these bad tenants out faster. Now, it doesn't mean that you should never, ever use Nevada or never use Wyoming, never use Delaware. And I, I, honestly, there are times when those structures work really, really well. But it's something, again, you have to plan it out ahead of time, understand what you're doing and where you're going before you start to go down that path. 
So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that I haven't bored you at this point. I want to sum up. And my goal today, what I really wanted to do was, was to try to keep it simple, give you some straightforward information designed to help you kind of develop an asset protection structure that works for you, that doesn't break the bank for you, that isn't overly complicated, and that is easy to maintain. So again, those five points, just kind of sum it up. I want to see you use a real estate or, or an LLC for your real estate, unless you've got a specific reason not to, and there are some. I want to see you make the right tax choice for your LLCs. Take a look at what you're doing. If you're flipping or developing, you want an active tax classification. If you're holding, if you're sitting and holding and it's all rental income, you want a passive one. Keep it simple. Don't, don't make up a giant structure. You do not need it in the early days. You can always make it bigger later. Keep it going. You know, keep, file those annual reports. File those registered agent renewals. You know, pay your taxes and, and be smart in your LLC location. Start it where your property is located. Start it where your business operation is. Don't bother with an out-of-state LLC in the early days. They're going to cost you money. And they will not give you any benefit. So those are my five points. I have blasted through this, hopefully not too quickly. And I am, I am ready to turn this one back over to Matt, take your questions, and, and you know, hopefully have it, have it gone too fast. Awesome. Well, let me just jump in here real quick <clears throat> and ask folks, just go ahead and, and type in the chat box and let us know how you're doing at this point, what you've thought so far. Is your head spinning? Are you writing notes so fast that you're uh, creating smoke with your uh, your pencil there? Uh, or, um, you know, it, you know, what did you think so far of, uh, of the content that Megan presented? Go ahead and give us a little feedback and let us know kind of where you're at. Are you a little bit overwhelmed? Uh, or is this stuff that, you know, maybe you're pretty familiar with this stuff if you're an experienced, uh, you know, sophisticated, advanced investor. You've been doing this for a decade. Maybe you're familiar with these concepts. Um, so go ahead and, and give us a little feedback and let us know how things are going so far. Uh, I'll let Megan take a breath, uh, get a drink of water, uh, and all that. Uh, but one of the things um, as we move into the to the question period, we're about to open up the floor in a minute. Um, you know, I Megan and I have have had a business relationship that goes back, as I said, you know, probably at least five years. Um, and she's been fantastic for a lot of our clients uh, in advising them and helping them do a lot of the things correctly um, that she explained uh, here. And by the way, folks, you know, it's it's. I, I want to just add a little personal anecdote about how important I think it is to get this stuff correct. I mean, when I was starting out, maybe about ten years ago, probably. With my real estate investing, I wanted to do the asset protection right, and I was so excited about it. I read all the books I could read about asset protection, and I talked to all these lawyers, and man, they sold me exactly what Megan told you not to do. They told me, get a different LLC for every single entity. You know, I was on my 10 property, you know, strategy. I was going to buy 10 properties, and, you know, I had about six or so, and, and oh, we'll just start LLC number seven, number eight now, and then when you close, you can put it in, and I, you know, and then on top of your 10 LLCs, you should have another LLC that'll own all the 10, so you have a layering structure, and then you need another one to manage that structure, and, yeah, I mean, it was just crazy, and I, I went for it, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to be so excited, you know. I was so excited that I was going to have a super airtight, you know, thing, and and all, and it was just, and then you realize, whoa, I got to pay annual fees for every single one of these LLCs, and I got to do all of this stuff, and it was just crazy. It was completely the wrong way to go, um, you know. So I, I just want to, you know, particularly for folks that are just starting out, it's really important both to understand, you know, the the substantive decisions that you're going to be making to make sure you're protected properly, but you also want to make sure that you're doing it in a cost-effective way uh, and not overpaying for things that are unnecessary um, and, and overly cumbersome. And so, um, uh, anyways, one of the things that I uh, that Megan was, was very kind to do was to make a special offer for our clients uh, on the webinar tonight, and I want her to put that out there before people start jumping off the webinar. Um, I know when we go into questions, sometimes I can go for a little while and, and some people start jumping off. So, um, Megan, do you want to uh, put that out there now for uh, folks that are here tonight? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what I would like to do is I'd like to, to invite everybody that's listening tonight to come and visit my website, the smartbusinessincorporation.com. You can pick up information there, including a couple of special reports on LLC creation and maintenance, and also a more in-depth look at series LLCs and how they might work. The other thing that I wanted to, to offer up to everybody tonight 
is a free 20-minute telephone consultation on LLC and asset protection topics. Um, to do that, what I'd like to do is you can see on the screen, you know, just shoot me an email. My address is on the screen. It's Megan at smartbusinessincorporation.com. Use the subject line Maverick Client Consult so I know where you've come from. Post your questions and a couple of times that we can sit and talk and then I can give you a call back and we can go through your questions and help you get set up. Um, usually I find 20 minutes is pretty good for a lot of people. If we need more then you know we can talk about it. Um, but I, it's, it's just a good way. I really want to make sure that you guys get what you need and not what you don't. Guys, this is a really valuable um, offer, and uh, you know, to be able to have 20 minutes of completely individualized, customized focus time for yourself with Megan is a really high value offer. And so, what I would encourage you to do is, you know, definitely feel free to throw out some questions tonight uh, in the question period. Here, we'll try to uh, see if we can answer at least one question from everybody uh, tonight, depending on how many there are. <laughs> Uh, but you know, uh, this is going to be a way for you to go deeper um, with Megan into your personal situation because again, everybody's personal situation is going to be different and their goals and what they're doing as, as hopefully you heard one size doesn't fit all. So uh, you know, I would definitely encourage you to take Megan up on this offer. It's a really high value uh, offer. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, all right, Megan, the first question uh, we're going to take uh, from a fellow Canadian, uh, from Wayne, uh, yeah. who says, uh, yes, uh, I'm also Canadian and my lawyer told me to put my properties in an LLC and then set up an LLP that owns the LLC so that I don't have double taxation in Canada and still get the full legal protection. Uh, does Megan agree with this strategy for Canadians? I think it's more complicated than it needs to be. Um, for most Canadians, I think that it's just as easy for you to set up a limited partnership. This is one of those where I wish that there was a better way, but I think that a standard traditional limited partnership with a corporate general partner, um, both companies set up in the United States is the best way to go for you. What it'll do the problem with LLCs is that the, the US-Canada tax treaty, um, Canada does not recognize LLCs, not single owner ones. And the problem is when that money, it does absolutely fine in the United States, but when you get back to Canada, uh, the money gets absolutely hammered by Revenue Canada. And you'll wind up, you know, instead of being at a rate where it could be anywhere from like zero to eight to 10% tax on any income you've got, you're gonna wind up with like 40 to 50 by the time Revenue Canada gets ready, adding a bunch of mismatches, things that they won't allow in one country and they will in the other. So my, my, I have looked at this, asked this, this particular issue time and time and time again for Canadians, and I really have come to the conclusion that the only safe way for you to do this is with the limited partnership and a corporate general partner. Okay. I just don't see any other way to do it effectively. Okay. Uh, Wayne, and if you want to go deeper on that with Megan, because um, I know you're uh, acquiring uh, a number of assets in the U.S., um, you know, I would definitely encourage you, for example, to take advantage of this phone consult. I think you guys can have a pretty substantive conversation on, um, you know, what might be uh, uh, best or how you may want to refine um, or new ideas, uh, you know, that you may want to implement. Um, let's keep rolling through the questions. Um, next question, Megan, can you switch from a member-managed LLC to a manager-managed LLC after the entity has already been created? Yes, you can, and how you do that is going to depend on your state, where you set it up in the state laws. Sometimes you will need to actually go back to the state and file an amendment to your articles of organization. Other times where the, the state does not make you differentiate at the time you set it up, then you can just change your internal documents. So just special minutes saying, hey, this is what we're going to do, create a new operating agreement and go forward as manager managed. So yes, you can, and how the, the, the mechanics of how you do it depend on your state. Great. Um, okay, Steve asks, if you're a higher income individual who maxes out SS tax anyway from a W-2 job, are you still going to be paying self-employment tax for flips in an LLC? I believe so. Um, that's a question that is probably better asked of your tax preparer. Um, I am not a tax, I mean, I know enough to <laughs> get me into big trouble in theory, 
Um, so I don't want to give you an answer and say this is the absolute truth, but yeah, I believe that self-employment tax just keeps going and going and going. Okay. Um, next question. Um, all right, so we've got a couple people that are asking about the uh, due on sale clause uh, that could potentially be triggered when uh, transferring a property if you get a mortgage on it in your personal name, which most most banks require you to do, yep. uh, and then you close on the property, and then if you transfer the property into your LLC, there's a couple of different questions. I want to kind of try to wrap them together. Maybe you can speak to them about, you know, will that trigger a due on sale clause? Will it be a problem? A couple other people have asked, you know, is, does that split? you know, liability since you personally are on the hook for the mortgage but the property is in the LLC, is there any way, you know, how does that work in terms of asset protection and liability? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the basic truth of it, in terms of, of liability, you signed the personal guarantee for the mortgage, so whether or not you put it in an LLC, you've indebted yourself to the bank. Um, what it does do if you put it into an LLC means that the guy who, you know, rams his car through the tree on your property because he was drunk can't sue you personally even though you guaranteed the mortgage. He's stuck suing the LLC, but you don't have any protection from the bank in that aspect because you guaranteed the mortgage. Um, so the other part of your question, the due on sale clause, this has been one of those really tricky ones over the years. I can tell you that in all of the time that I've been doing this, I've never ever seen a bank actually actually come down and, and do it. I just see people transfer your properties. As long as the, the bill gets paid, I just do not see there being a problem. If there is, you can always move it back. Um, but I honest to God, in all of the time that I'm doing this, I have never seen a bank actually flip out and say, if you don't do this, you know, all, all our lawyer, we're sick our lawyers on you. All right. I've never seen it either. Um, so, uh, you know, if somebody has had that experience, that would be interesting to know about. Uh, I haven't seen it, but you definitely need to, uh, you know, take your own precautions, you know, understand the situation, understand, you know, any risks that are involved in whatever you're doing, and obviously, you know, consult, uh, you know, all of the appropriate, um, you know, folks before you make any uh, personal financial decisions um, with regard to that. But, um, okay, the next question is... Um, is, oh, wait, we already asked that one, I'm sorry. Um, oh, the next question, let's just go with this, a very simple one. What is the normal cost for setting up an LLC? That absolutely, that, that completely depends on, on who does it. If you're doing it yourself, um, you know, you're looking at your filing fees for the state, you're looking at a registered agent cost, um, you can choose to act as your own agent, it's something that I do and I don't recommend, it depends on the circumstances. Um, you know, you can pay a company like mine, we charge a fee to prepare and do all of the documentation and we, we arrange for your registered agent service, um, we pay the filing fees for you and then we have our own fee on top and every state is different, you know, it's fifty dollars I think to file one in, in, in Colorado, it's five hundred dollars to file one in Massachusetts. So it, it depends, a state by state by state thing. And what I do anytime that I'm talking to somebody, and once I figured out what they want, I will always give them a detailed quote that's specific to what they're doing. Okay. Uh, the next question is, would most tax accountants know how to file annual reports uh, and know the best way uh, to make a tax election uh, if it was an LLC? Okay, in terms of making the tax selection, yes. In terms of filing your annual reports, not necessarily. I know that some CPAs, some accountants will do it. Most of them don't want to, and most of them view that as something quite separate from, from their role, which is to give you tax advice and file your tax returns. Um, traditionally, at least in my business, you know, we, we provide resident agent service, formation service, and maintenance. And so part of what we do for clients is we will contact them ahead of time and it's like this is when your report's coming up, this is what it says now, do you have any changes, you know, and we'll, we'll help them get through that filing process, but I would not guarantee that your accountant or tax preparer will do that for you because most of the time they won't unless it's a type of state where the report is more of a tax report. So a lot of, and, and again, it just starts to get funky and every state is different. Um, Texas, for example, has two. 
on the 15th of May of yeah 15th of May every year all companies in Texas have to file two reports one is a franchise tax return and the other is called a personal information report now both of those are filed with the franchise tax board so you'd think okay well the CPA you know my accountant can do it but one of them talks about the ownership which is not necessarily something that your accountant may know right off the top of their head they can give you the numbers to do your franchise tax return but they may not know the information for your personal information report and so it's it's something that you kinda have to look at and and check out with whoever's helping you like what will you do for me in terms of my maintenance what can I expect from you in future years and the same question I mean, it's fair to ask that of your CPA or your tax preparer ask them what they'll do see some will some won't and it will depend on the state and the person yeah guys really important um, you know to make sure that your tax professional that you're working with is really uh, you know either a specialist in these types of issues or that you have a separate asset protection specialist that's coordinating with your CPA so you want to make sure that your team of advisors are at least covering all of this stuff because it's you know I would actually I would actually go as far as to say that most CPAs don't know how to do most of this stuff because most CPAs just deal with you know W-2 wage earner people and they know how to file a regular tax return and you know they don't deal with businesses and entities and you know investors and and all that kind of stuff so you know definitely an important interview question and um, you know definitely something you want to make sure you at least have someone on your team that knows how to handle uh, all of that oh um, absolutely second third fourth fifth that that, that sentiment um, you know the, the, I think that one of the most valuable people on your team is going to be your tax advisor and you absolutely must have somebody who is very well versed in real estate tax it, it's just so important that they, there is so much specialized knowledge in that field um, I have been really privileged to work with some of the best people in the country over the years and I have, I have absolutely learned the difference between people who know their business who know real estate and people who don't so you know absolutely the questions that you want to be asking in an interview is you know do you are you an investor yourself I, I think that's an absolute crucial question and, and you know for your advisor it's like how good are you with real estate how familiar are you with real estate professional elections you know there's there's just it's so important it's more important than ever because it's it's an area that is under scrutiny through the IRS all right, next question. I live in California and I have a Nevada property in a Nevada LLC. The LLC is taxed as a disregarded entity. Yep. Do I have to pay the California LLC tax? According to the Franchise Tax Board, yes, you do. And that is because, and I believe it was 2010, California changed their tax laws. Um, prior to that, a disregarded entity they didn't care about. But now, um, now they do and basically California has taken the position that because you control your LLC and because you are sitting in your comfortable office chair somewhere in California you have created a tax nexus a tax connection to the state through your activities on behalf of your LLC and because you've done that you now have an obligation to file your LLC cross register it into the state of California and give them their eight hundred dollars a year now, if you've got a dis, you know, a disregarded LLC that's not showing up on a separate tax return, it's hard for the state to track. They may not catch you. Um, however, should you ever be in an audit situation where they come and look at your books, I guarantee that they will ask you or demand or make you register that LLC into the state of California now. All right, next question. I'm confused about when to set up an out-of-state LLC. If you own multiple properties in multiple states, mm -hmm. but only have an LLC where you live, what is best to do at this point? Okay, can you run that one back? Okay, so you've got yeah. multiple LLCs already? No, he doesn't say that. He says he's got um, one LLC in the state uh -huh. where he lives but he owns multiple properties in multiple other states okay um, you know you've got a couple of ways to go there is absolutely nothing that will stop you from taking your existing LLC and doing what they, the cross registration into each state where you have property okay that will give you the legal standing that you need 
to evict somebody or to defend yourself in a lawsuit should something happen on that property, you may look at it and say, well, geez, somehow I've managed to you know, amass a million dollars in equity and I'm kind of uncomfortable putting all my eggs in this one basket. And it may be time to look at you know, doing a couple of LLCs, kind of doing a strategic look at what you've got and, and see how to split it up where it's not going to cost you a bomb. I don't want to see you set up an LLC in every state. I don't think that's necessary. Um, but depending on what you've got, you may want to look at maybe creating another one or doing something to help yourself spread that risk out a little. So this is, and this is Julie who asked the question. So for Julie, if she, let's say she was comfortable with, let's say, three properties in, in an LLC, mm -hmm. um, she can take the LLC in her home state, and even if she owns pr three properties in three totally separate states, she just has to register that LLC to do business. Yes. in the states where the properties are located exactly. and then she can add those properties into the LLC and have all of the protections and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, Julie, hopefully that uh, clarifies your question. Um, okay, so and then Edwin was just clarifying when you say, when you use the term start an LLC in the property state, do you mean the state in which the property is located? Yes, I do. Um, if you and your property, that your investment property, are both in the same state, super. If you're not, then I would still suggest going to that state and making that the place where you set up your LLC. Awesome. Okay. And we've got some more questions coming in here. All right, let's make sure. I want to try to get one from everybody here and make sure that we get doing my best to make sure we get at least. Um, okay, this question is, if you have multiple LLCs in different states, is it better to have a holding company to link all of the LLCs? Um, I don't know if it does. You know, I, I don't know if, if it's a one-owner thing. If, if you're the only owner, then all of your LLCs are kind of reporting onto your personal tax return on Schedule E's anyway. Um, I don't think that putting a central LLC necessarily makes a lot of sense unless perhaps you wanted to use that as kind of a de facto property management company where you're thinking I would really dearly love to just have one company where I'm writing all my checks instead of ten um, but that then gets into other issues which is like well do I have to take that holding company and register it into all of these states that I've got properties located in so I think that's one that, that we kind of look at what you've got where you've got it and what the costs would be um, versus the benefits and we'd probably look at that more on a one-on-one -on -one situation. Um, but my, my first thought is, is I'm not sure that a holding company would help you too much. Okay. Next question. How good is dual LLC asset protection? Meaning, LLC number one for buying and holding the property, and LLC number two to buy options on those properties so that when LLC number one gets sued, all the property uh, transferred to LLC number two so it's not part of the lawsuit. Um, that's, that's not a bad idea. Um, it's probably one that you'd want to talk with your the, a real estate attorney in your state and just make sure that the, the different sort of litigation and creditor protections in your state will allow you to do that. But on the face of it, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. Okay. Uh, next question. Can I be on the title on the property and have the LLC as the beneficiary? I don't think so. Okay. Um, okay. If, you're, if your name is on the title... And, and I'm assuming that maybe we're talking about a trust situation here where you may be the trustee and your LLC may be the beneficiary. Um, and I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure if that's going to help you out too much. Um, I'd rather see the title just be in the name of the LLC. Okay. But there may be more to that question that I don't understand. Okay. Um, next question. I formed two separate LLCs one in my home state and one in the state that I was going to buy property. 
I did not end up buying the property in the other state. Since I do not plan to buy properties in that other state now, should I dissolve these LLCs? Yes. All right. Yes. I, I don't see any reason to keep them. You're going to spend money keeping them up, um, at least in registered agent fees. And if you're not using them, I, I would just dissolve them, let them go. Okay. Um, we got a couple more. Are you are you good for a couple more questions, Megan? Maybe yeah. like three three or four more minutes or so. Yeah, all good. Awesome. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see here. I, I want to try to see if we can find some people that have not gotten questions answered yet. Uh, okay, so there, there's a few, uh, there's a couple types of questions that I may want to group together. Some people are asking about um, the number of properties per LLC. Mm -hmm. Is is one property per LLC too uh, cumbersome? How many, uh, you know, what type of dollar amount or number of properties uh, do you recommend for an LLC? And I don't know, Megan, if you want to maybe talk about what you see kind of, you, you know, your clients doing or if you have any personal recommendations for that. You know, I... I... <laughs> Boy, I used to say that put as much in an LLC as you're comfortable having attacked by a creditor all at the same time. So if all of your money comes from passive income sources, then I think it would behoove you to separate your things out. So if you have a problem on one grouping of properties, it isn't going to impact your ability to have income from everything else. Um, you know, I, I think that generally speaking... I don't know. I, I come back to sort of the half a million dollar mark, but it will depend on everybody and your own risk tolerance and what you feel is okay and what it isn't. Um, you know, and it just becomes a question of what's the value of your properties? How much of your income does it does do they make up? How much of your income is, is made up in these properties? And the more that you rely on the income from these properties to make your own bills and, and you know, cover your own monthly nut, then the more you want to look at separating them out. I mean, the other thing that I would add too, as a consideration point, is you know maybe the extent to which they're leveraged. Because yeah. if if you encumber your properties, right? Yeah. So let's say you have a, a mortgage of eighty percent on your property, and you have five properties, and they uh -huh. all have eighty percent mortgages. Well, you know, the the twenty percent equity in each of the five properties would basically be equivalent to one free and clear property. Exactly. How much equity you have there? So, you know, thinking about how much equity you want to have in an LLC is one measurement, you know, that some people use, and therefore, you know, one property versus five might just depend on whether or not you have them leveraged and you have them encumbered, because oh, yeah. encumbering your properties is another form of asset protection, right? If somebody's looking to sue. Uh, you know, and they see, hey, you got a property that's totally free and clear, that's a pretty desirable target. But if they say, okay, this bank has a first lien position of 80% on the property, that's not quite as desirable of a target for a lawsuit. So, um, you know, there's a lot of considerations, and a lot of it comes down to personal risk, you know, tolerance too. It's kind of like insurance, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how much do you want, how high is your deductible, you know, a lot of that comes down to personal preference. But I think the way a lot of people think about it is, one, how much equity do you have in there? Two, as Megan said, you know, how much of your income, uh, you know, the percentage of your total income is, is coming from this LLC, and, and if there was a disruption, how much would that hurt you, and, and that kind of stuff. So you can, you know, think about it in, uh, you know, in those types of uh, terms. One of the other things that we'll also suggest to people is when you've got properties that are free and clear, those are certainly candidates to be on their own because those are big rape targets, you know, and, and let's just say that you did have, maybe you do have three properties in an LLC, one of them's free and clear and the other two are encumbered up to 80%. Well, if I'm a creditor and I'm coming after you, I don't care about those 80% properties, even if that's where the tenant lived. I'm going after that free and clear one because that's just big tempting target. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I think we I think a number of people are asking similar questions um, uh, so I think we've covered kind of uh, you know some of the, I wanted to try to cover the groupings and the sort of the themes of the questions that are coming in mm -hmm. um, okay here's an interesting one uh, Joshua is asking should I start an LLC before I begin investing or after I've already started investing um, I would say honestly on that one it depends on where you're at and what state you're in there are some states where it's really expensive to start an LLC. California is one of them. 
um, you know, California has a, a, what they call a privilege tax or franchise tax that kicks in whether your LLC is active, whether it's not doing anything, um, whether it makes money, whether it loses money. They are coming after you for a minimum of $800 a year. And so if you are just getting started in California and you don't have a property yet under your belt, I'm not sure that you want to be paying out money when there is no return. You have no asset in there to offset that expense because you have no income yet. And most states, to be honest, um, with, with some exceptions, like North Dakota is a terrible state. Anybody that's active in North Dakota, you need to give yourself at least 30 days from, from when you need an LLC to when you will have it because they are incredibly backed up and they have been there for months. But other states like Nevada, I can have an LLC formed in a couple of hours. So I don't need a whole ton of time. Um, generally speaking, I, I think that, that you know, if you're looking at buying a property, I think reasonably, you know, by the time you get that property into your name, there's going to be a period of, of you know, anywhere from like 14 to 30 days, and I think that's fairly reasonable. In most states, that's enough time to get an LLC set up. So if somebody's thinking about it, you know, and you're entering into a contract, then I guess I, my thought would be, you know, in your contract, you'll want to state that you may take title in your name or you may take title in the name of an LLC. You know, you'll let them know because you're not doing those documents up right away and then get your LLC set up before you close. All right. Um, the next question uh, is from Savio. Uh, to provide and protect a money partner interest in a property, would it be possible to have them as a shareholder in the LLC for that specific property purchase? Not necessarily. When you come into an LLC, if you're given an ownership interest in an LLC, then you own a portion of that LLC and in theory it would be a portion of all of its assets. You know, if, you, if you're buying a 10% interest in an LLC, then you're entitled to 10% of everything. Now, if you are giving somebody money that is just going to invest in a single property, then you may want to do something different. You may want to do, and again, talk to an attorney in your state, look at possibly doing a UCC financing statement, some type of extra encumbrance that you put personally against that property to help to secure your loan. All right. Um, okay. Just want to make sure that we've, I think we've pretty much gotten one from everybody. Oh, interesting uh, comment uh, on our earlier discussion. Larry is mentioning that I have a colleague. I asked if anybody had ever heard of anybody that, that got a due on sale clause trigger. Larry says, I have a colleague who had the due on sale clause happen and simply decided to transfer the property back out into his own name as the solution. So um, that's thanks for that, uh, Larry. But yeah, I mean, I've you know I've personally uh, done that. I've I've uh, you know with my properties, I've uh, transferred them into LLCs, and then you know when I need to refinance them, I've taken them back out and I refinance them, and then you know put them back in. Yep. Uh, you know, so you know through the quick claim process or the grant bargain sale deed process or you know whatever the appropriate oh, uh, no, process. No claims. No quick claims. Try to stay away from quick claims. Okay. Well, actually, could you speak to that? Because we had a couple uh, questions. Uh, there, I tried to kind of group them together, but I didn't get all the details. So right. people are asking about quick claiming. They're asking if there's you know any other risks or, or things they should be aware of when moving, you know, particularly properties that they have a personal mortgage on, moving mm -hmm. them into and out of entities. Maybe you could uh, speak to that. Yeah, I actually prefer that you use a warranty deed or a grant deed rather than a quick claim. Um, and that is simply because there are times a quick claim will sever everything, including any title insurance that you have, whereas a warranty deed or a grant deed may not. And, you know, I, I guess I look at it this way. You buy a property, everything is great, you quick claim it into your LLC, and then you find out that a corner of your property is sitting on Indian band land and they want it back. Um, but when you quick claim it and kill your title insurance, you can't go back to the people who did your original title insurance and say, hey, fix this um, because you killed it when you did that quick claim deed. So generally speaking, I prefer to see other deeds used just to try to keep that title insurance alive and going. And Megan, does that vary um, by state, yeah. like a, a grant deed or yeah. I've heard it called yeah, a grant absolutely. bargain sale deed? You, you need to be, uh, you know, use a state specific? Yes, use a state specific and whoever is helping you with your closing, that's, that's something to bring up with them. Hey, if I you know, is there a way that I could preserve my title insurance? Will in this state, will 
using a grant or a warranty deed preserve my existing title insurance or will it sever? Um, it's definitely a question to ask. You know, it's just one of those little goofy things that, that I found out years ago and it's another one of those little hacks that not everybody knows but I wish they did. Right. Uh, oh, here's actually a really good question from David. Uh, what are the costs to transfer a property in or out of an LLC such as transfer taxes? That will depend on your state, okay? And it's again, this is part of why I really like to talk to people and plan things out before they buy stuff because it can make a big difference. Most of the eastern seaboard states charge a full transfer tax when you're moving property into an LLC even if you are the 100% owner of that LLC. Most western states don't do that and the Midwest are always somewhere in between. Um, I had a client and, and this one, it made me, this is one of the things that drove me insane because we went to them ahead of time and asked if we could do this transfer and it was Pennsylvania. And we did a transfer, we moved a property and found out after the fact that they, they you know, reassessed her and hit her up for a $5,000 transfer tax. And, you know, we had gone to them and said, hey, this is the transfer we want to do. Please don't record the deed. If the, You know, we talked to your office. We were told that this was a tax-free transfer. And they told us, well, you shouldn't listen to what we say because, I mean, honest to God, well, we were wrong. I said, well, wait a minute. We're relying on you to know what you're doing. You know, we're coming to you and asking ahead of time, will this result in tax? And you said no. And now you're saying, yes, it does, and we shouldn't have relied on you because you didn't know what you were talking about. So we appealed it, we appealed it, my client lost. You know, I wound up paying a big chunk of it because I felt so bad and learned a very, very hard lesson on that. Check before you do this. It's one of the reasons why, if, if it's possible to, when you're buying a property, take it directly into your LLC rather than bouncing it through your name first. I really would like to see you do that if you can. And if you can't, you can't, but at least factor those costs into your overall budget and your planning process. And there may, I mean, Megan, I, I've heard also, I mean, I, I remember doing this myself in certain situations when uh, you have a, you know, a high transfer tax situation or a, you know, a penalty for going either in or out of the LLC, that in some states they have actually rules where if their property goes through a trust, you know, either from an, you know, let's say from your personal name into an LLC or from an LLC into you, whichever one they hit you for the transfer tax on or both. Mm -hmm. But but some states might have rules where, hey, if you go from the LLC to a trust and then from the trust to your personal name, you're able to legally avoid the transfer tax, right? So, you know, depending on what state your property's oh, yeah. in and what the local laws are, you always want to be aware of that because sometimes there's a very simple solution. You could just set up a, an inexpensive trust and just, you know, triangulate the property through that and, and you know, and by, legally bypass the, you know, some of those requirements in other states that may not work. So, you know, you really need folks to um, consult with a professional that knows what they're doing um, and have an advanced plan. Say, okay, I'm thinking about, you know, acquiring a couple properties in, you know, Philadelphia, for example, uh, and then I want to acquire a couple in, you know, this other city, for example, and those states are going to have different laws and there might be different strategies and you can build in, build that into your, you know, your asset protection plan. Yeah, I mean, if there is, I, I know Pennsylvania, again, that was, like I said, they're, they're, they were on my my list of places I wasn't very happy with for a very long time. So, you know, if that triangulation feature works in Pennsylvania, that's fantastic because so far I haven't found anything that, that would avoid them hitting that transfer tax. Okay. Um, awesome. So, guys, I'm going to let uh, Megan go. She's been here. We're almost going on uh, 90 minutes here. Uh, Megan, I want to really thank you so much for your time. It's always incredibly substantive. I always learn something. No matter how many uh, events we do or conversations we have, I, I learn new things each time. And uh, it's really, really uh, fantastic uh, to have you here. I know a lot of folks have written comments in the chat box saying how much they've gotten out of this and everything. So uh, uh, thank you for that. And folks, I want to, uh, again, kind of conclude here with uh, reiterating the offer that Megan is making to you for being part of the Maverick community and the relationship that we have with Megan. She's willing to offer you a 20-minute personal phone consultation. I would highly advise you to take her up on that offer and in preparation for your phone consultation to make that as effective as you can, think about where you're at with your own real estate investing strategy, 
what your personal goals are, what you think you might want to do, um, and then you know prepare you know some specific questions. Um, you know prepare to tell Megan who you are. I live in this state. I'm thinking about buying properties potentially in these other states. You know here's how many properties or how fast I'm planning to acquire them. Um, you know, and this kind of stuff, and 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 really, just I mean, you know, use her as a resource during those 20 minutes to try to help to, you to develop your strategy and get your game plan for how you want to go about um, and approach this. So you'll have a plan uh, as you're investing in real estate to make sure that you protect those assets that you're buying. So with that, Megan, thank you so much for being here. It's really been great to have you. Oh, I you know I've really enjoyed it. It's it's been a while since we've done a webinar together, and I kind of forgot how much fun they are. Um, I hope that I haven't bored everybody. I hope that you've all gotten something useful out of it. It's a topic that that you know this has been a big part of my world for for fifteen odd years now. So, uh, you know, I could talk for hours and hours and hours, and and either bore people to death or overwhelm them with information. So I, I'm hoping that we struck a good balance for you tonight. Awesome. Um, and well, thanks. Uh, hope to do another one of these soon. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here, Megan, and uh, good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.